Uh, next up is Barry, of VE4MA. Uh, Barry's been active on all EME bands since 1974 and has operated on, uh, yeah, from 40 to 32 to 47 gigahertz. He participated in the first ever 24 gigahertz QSO, and that was with me. How about that? And uh, has been he, quite a few years ago. It was 01, I think. I think it was. And uh, has been involved with the first 78 gigahertz EME experiments. Barry's authored and presented many uh, amateur conference papers on EME, dish feeds, and solid state and vacuum tube amplifiers, and also low noise amplifiers. He received the Central States VHF Society John T. Chambers Award in 2000 and again in 2008. He also received the ARRL Microwave Development Award in 2003, the Northern Lights uh, Westland Award in 2008, and the Microwave Update Don Hilliard Award in 2016. At this time, please uh, welcome Barry V. 4 ma Anyway, this, uh, this paper I originally presented in 2003 at Microwave Update, but there was no published copy of it. So, And with talking with Al, uh, there's so much more interest in 47 gigs that uh, he thought it was uh, still timely to talk about it. So. Uh, some of the testing methodology that I used was a little bit dated, but that's what I had and still have. So, Anyway, moving right along, I'm going to talk about why the use of WR28 is significant, talk about the technical specs, some of the problems anticipated, test results, and then some recommendations. So what's the significance of WR28 on 47 gigs? Well, I mean, what's that? Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's intended for 26 to 40 use, so it's a little bit outside of the 47 gig band, but readily available on the surplus market at good prices, or at least it used to be. Don't see so much of it around anymore. I think it's all been squirreled away by hams, I think. Uh, WR22 and WR19, which is commonly used when, when you really should be using the right stuff, it, it's rare and expensive. Uh, you know, the round and square waveguide flanges interconnect with WR22 flanges, so, you know, 28 is a pretty good fit in that regard. Problems anticipated with WR28, well, the dominant propagation mode is, is dependent on the width of the waveguide. And there is a tendency as you go, it'll go into higher modes uh, at higher frequencies, and Particularly, that'll get triggered if you've got any discontinuities in the waveguide. So, you know, we can expect that we might have problems with bends and twists, and, you know, other than a straight piece of waveguide, yeah, you may have some issues. So, this is what, uh, what the propagation of the waveguide looks, looks like uh, in the proper operating mode. I'm not a real waveguide uh, technical guy, but. Uh, but anyway, the cutoff wavelength is 21 gigs, so it'll operate down to that okay. And then above 40, well, take your chances. The next higher mode is uh, TE11. And the, uh, whoops, we're not going to use the technology here. There we go. The next mode for it to operate is at 47.2 gigs, which is uh, that's pretty close. So you know, at 47 gigs, then we should be really close to kicking off into a higher order mode. And then the next higher mode, the the, the cutoff is 59 gigs, so that's really not going to be a problem for us. So the measurement system I had, it was a scalar network analyzer, an HP8757, 80, and I had some good waveguide detectors. I had an old tube uh, sweeper, but it had a 3 to 33 to 50 plug-in. It had a good waveguide directional coupler and various loads and attenuators. And I, I built the test system to, to run in WR22 waveguide with round flanges. And, uh, and I also had some commercial round or rectangular adapters. And so the tests I conducted were, were uh, return loss and through attenuation, and I just swept it conveniently from 40 to 50 gigs so we could see what was going on. 
So I tested a bunch of pieces, which I, I had shown you on the original slide, the collection of pieces that I had. The first piece I had was a two inch straight waveguide piece. And this is the result. So this is the insertion loss. So this is 40 gigs, there's 50, the red line is 47. So you can see it's humming along pretty good. And then as it gets close to 47, we've got a little bit of a dip and, and maybe a little more up here at around 50 gigs, but it's not too bad. I mean, that's, let's say three or four tenths of a dB, maybe four tenths. Return loss, now this is the loads that I had, the waveguide detector loads, the return loss inherent in those is only on the order of 20 dB anyway. So because I'm just using the detector, the, you know, the fact the return loss is only showing 20 dB is not necessarily accurate of what the waveguide is, is really good for. Um, if I was, had enough dynamic range, I would have put an attenuator in there and, uh, and uh, m made a good, uh, good, a better match on the detector. But uh, so anyway, it, it it appears to work reasonably well. Now, if you're running, you know, moon bounce power or something, you probably wouldn't be using WR28 anyway. But you'd be losing quite a bit of power through uh, just a two-inch piece of straight waveguide. The next piece I tested was a nine-inch straight piece of waveguide. You wouldn't expect we'd see an awful lot different. And yeah, it's pretty much the same. Now you can see in this case, I had a 10 dB attenuator there and, and our return loss is uh, you know, unbelievably down at uh, you know, 35 dB sort of thing. So the return loss is really good. Insertion loss is actually a little bit better, you know, a couple of tenths of a dB at 47. And it's not quite as flat up here, but we don't care about that really. It's right around 47. This uh, little dip is a bit of a concern, but potentially, you know, what variation do you get between pieces? Who knows, right? I only had a few pieces to play with at the time. Remember, this is 2003, so it's a while ago. And uh, I think everybody probably has a bunch of these flex pieces. Well, how well do these things work out? You know, they're certainly very convenient for hooking stuff together. And uh, you can see it's a, a little more volatile in the insertion loss. Still pretty good at 47. Again, there's this little dip there just at around 48. And then maybe a little bit at the end. Return loss is still really good. Not really a problem. And I had a little uh, 90 degree bend that came off of a 39 gig dish flex and uh, flat flanges as well. Still, everything is flat flanges at this point. You know, uh, you know what I mean by flat flanges versus choke flanges, the ones that have the little grooves in there to, uh, to improve the, uh, the, the uh, uh, coupling losses and leakage that you might get from a joint. OK, so this is what it looked like. And now, well, lots of. Uh, jumping around again and well we're down around half a dB at 47 and return loss is still good that's no problem you know it, it's unfortunate I couldn't sweep uh, down lower just to see how good these pieces were down uh, where they're intended to be used but uh, can't do everything so I had a nice piece of uh, rectangular waveguide an e-plane bend and uh, yeah, we got some variations in here again, but loss is really low. It's you know a couple of tenths, if that, and return loss is excellent. So no problem with an E-plane bend, but you wouldn't expect that to be a problem. It'll be the H-plane bends that will give us trouble, if anything. So here now we've got an E-plane bend plus a twist, which, okay, well, that might be interesting. And, hmm considerably flatter than anything else we've had before. And I would have thought the twist would, would have done something, you know, but uh, the return loss, now this is the detector load only, so, you know, it, it looks like it's fine. And again, up right at the top here, just around 50 gigs, we see this little roll off. And I don't know if that's, the, you know, the waveguide resonance or not. Okay, now what about an H-plane bend? Because that's the one we we're worried about. That's the one that could cause it to go into modes. Again, it's a nice commercial piece, uh, you know, silver plated and all that stuff. Uh, definitely a good, good piece of waveguide. Wow, 
Well, that's that's really flat in here. This is amazing, and still pretty good in here. You know, a couple tenths, quarter dB maybe. And uh, again, the detector loads, the return loss is fine. And again, we see this roll off uh, just just around 50 gigs. And you can tell, you know, it's even in the return loss you're seeing it. So there's something going on just close to 50 gigs. Time-wise, okay. Now this is an interesting one. This is a a cast 90-degree uh, bend. You know, you can see it's a real sharp bend rather than you know the nice formed rolled edges that we had on the previous uh, commercial ones. And it's also the first one that we've had with the choke flanges. And uh, let's see what that looked like. Yikes! It's a little hard to follow this now, so you know, if you follow the, in, the insertion loss, I mean, it's really terrible. And, uh, and then it goes down here and comes up, so I mean, it's really a big hit. Almost a dB, and, and look at the return loss. You know, it's bumping around, and this is only the detector load again, but then look at this big jump right here at, uh, at 48 and a half gigs and then back down again. So there's some resonant stuff going on here, moding stuff probably, right? That's the conclusion I had anyway, that okay, well, sharp bends are probably not very good. Okay, so I had uh, some loads to test, the low power load, you know, the standard uh, kind of one watt stuff. And uh, yeah, pretty good return loss all the way across, you know, at least uh, 20 dB uh, plus at uh, 47 at a high power load. And uh, of course, I had some high power to play with, so I, I needed that. Uh, I have a, in this picture, I actually have an adapter here between WR28 and 22, which I tested in both situations. So this was without the adapter. So this is just the WR28 and just connected right up, bang. So I mean the return loss is still 20 dB plus, no problem there. And if we go put the taper in, it gets better, quite a bit better. Not significantly in terms of loss or you know, not going to affect you performance-wise, but it is better. So better is always good, right? Okay, well, impedance matching to WR19 and 22. I mean, you know, if you really want to get you know, try and improve the match, you can you can use the bolted uh, step type transitions. You know, the quarter wave transformers that have been used. Um, I'm surprised that this PowerPoint is showing up like this. Oh, I know. Okay. Anyway, the smooth taper gives it much better broadband results. You saw that with that load. I mean, boy, it's nice and smooth. It's it's great. And uh, so the quarter wave transformer is okay, but it's it's going to be a narrower bandwidth. So I mean, that's what the quarter wave sandwich uh, uh, transformer looks like. You know, just a little plate. You've probably seen that in some of, uh, I think uh, Paul Drexler had made some available at Microwave Update years ago for 28 to uh, 42, I think it was, and and. Uh, Dick Colby had described some, so they've been they've been written up and they work very well. Okay, so one of the other components I went to test was uh, waveguide switches, and uh, a nice commercial switch. Uh, you know, waveguide switches is really uh, something that's critical for uh, for us. You can see uh, yeah, a little bit of roly poly and about half a dB loss, so it's not great. And then then we see this 49 and a half gig uh, resonance going on, and yeah, the return loss is okay, but it's not great. You know, it's, uh, yeah, so there's something going on. Now, that's an E-plane waveguide switch. You wouldn't think that there'd be any moding going on in there, but, yeah, I don't know. And I did some, I tried to do some tuning, and it flattened it out, but it didn't improve the loss any, so flattened out the insertion loss, but, so that wasn't, uh, wasn't a good experiment. Then I had an H-plane switch, also made by Wavelane, Wave, uh, Waveline, and uh, you know you would expect that the performance would be worse with that. Well, yeah, it's worse. I mean, have a look at that. I mean, whew, pretty wild. And the, this one at around 50 gigs is really bad, but this one is so close. 
to 47. That, uh, but still, at 47 exactly, it's a performance is pretty good. But uh, you know, who knows what what might shift it a little bit and get you. And then there was these beautiful little switches that came from New Zealand. You know, WR28, and they operated on 8.2 volts, and, you know, just tiny little things, and, oh, boy, this would be just great for 47. And, uh, yikes. You know, <clears throat> so look at that, insertion loss. So it's, uh, you know, over 3 dB. And I know that's been verified by other people, so it's really ugly. And the return loss is similarly very bad. You know, it's uh, what, 12 dB, so it's it's totally useless on 47. It uh, <clears throat> it works good on 24 though, but you know, for this I was looking for 47, which is really disappointing because it's a low power switch and it just would have been so nice. I also tested a uh, coupler, and. <clears throat> I didn't have any data on the coupler, but I thought it was a 6 dB coupler for just from the the letters that were on it. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know why, but uh, you can see that the insertion loss is uh, is about 12 dB in here, just above, uh, and then it rises up to about 7 dB forward. And the return loss is uh, well, it it deteriorates, but it's still okay at 47. But uh, hey, you know, whatever, if you're using it for coupling off power sampling, it's whatever you get out of it, that's fine. Just don't believe what the label says, that's all. You know, it's not calibrated there, so. Okay, so recommendations. It's okay to use WR28, you know, if the lowest lot loss is not required. You know, and, and most of the stuff we're doing, the absolute lowest isn't, isn't it real important unless you're doing moon bounce. And again, you're probably not going to use WR28. Use only short, straight sections if possible. You know, less chance of it uh, moting. You know, the e-plane bends should be best, and large radius preferred. Don't use those cast bends because they're probably going to give you trouble. Again, it's on a limited sample, but you know, the theory says there could be problems, and boom, sharp bends. So H. H-plane bends may be okay. Test it. You don't know. You know, there's no no guarantees. Uh, and the cast bends very very bad. Stay away from them. High power loads okay. Better with the taper. And wave lights, wave line switches are okay. The E-plane was the best, and the ZL waveguide switch was really bad. Choke flanges are suspect. Test them. Now, uh, Al Ward uh, has done some work, and it's in the proceedings. Uh, and yeah, he kind of confirms that some of the uh, some of the problems with the choke flanges are are the resonant effect of the you know the fact that the the choke is 26 to 40. It's not to 47. And if you could fill in the grooves a little bit, you'd probably be able to move those out. But you know, we haven't found a good way. Maybe some of these metallized epoxies or something. I don't know. But uh, anyway, test them and maybe avoid them if you, uh, if you can. So anyway, I've talked about why the use of that waveguide is important and the specs and flaw problems, test results, recommendations. Any questions?